up in the air. And maybe Kenny, you want to um, yeah, say something, uh, maybe starting with the Etrocher. I don't really need amplification. Thank you all so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you guys for coming out. I really appreciate it. Very kind of you in this day and age that we're living in. And um, well, I guess I'll start with the Richard Fritz. <laughs> I mean, it's, what I love about, I mean, I'm actually, you left out a couple of things. I also teach at the University of Zurich and the School of Visual Arts. I'm a professor in New York. And um, so writing, collecting, curating, and all of these things. But for me, it's really like one, one continuous practice because it all relates to everything that you can do within the confines of the art world. And in terms of Richard Prince, when you think about this image of the, of the nurse painting that Richard, this painting has gone through, to get to where it is today, leaning on a chair, it's been six different iterations. So. The painting was originally made by an illustrator for a novel, a romance novel, and then Richard Prince made uh, a silk screen of it and appropriated it, turned it into a painting. I actually used it in a two-dimensional collage that I made. When I write articles for Artnet magazine, I created this kind of platform where I embed within my writing illustrations, two-dimensional photographic manipulations, and also digital videos that I make which I also feature on, if any of you are suffering through my Instagram posts, not quite as courageous as your live Instagrams. But, so I make these short, these, these narrative videos that accompany my writing, and originally, when I presented the Corona Nurse, it was part of an image I made for an article, and then from there it turned into a painting that I did, and then into the print. So I think, for me, what's most interesting about the practice of Richard Prince, I mean, I have to say I wasn't terribly a fan, a much of a fan of his work at the early onset when I came across his work 25 years ago. But having studied law myself and the way that the art world works, and there's such a humongous amount of images in the world today, it's almost as if we really don't need to introduce, I don't need to, there's nothing really more I could say than sort of readdressing what's already been said. So in a way, this is a comment upon this kind of situation where we're all socially distanced and wearing masks when we're out in public for the most part. And again, relating to the crisis that we've been through, when I was holed up in New York in one room for three months and I was teaching via Zoom and writing and thinking a lot, which I think a lot of us have time to get off the kind of um, hamster wheel that the art world has become this relentless kind of pursuit of what I can't quite figure out but chasing the next art fair and the next biennial and triennial and running around all over the globe and not really going anywhere quickly. But Ed Ruscheh made this initial piece, paid nothing until September, uh, till April, a little bit confused where, where I am in which jurisdiction. Anyway, it was about like in the United States, taxes are due in April. So it was a comment like don't pay until taxes are due. But I mean, right now in America, in New York, there's a non-rent, a non-payment of rent movement because people just, people don't have, I mean, we're talking about, it's art, and it's, we're in a situation where in America alone, nearly 120,000 people have lost their lives in this virus. And not only that, but like, restaurants have been closed and so many businesses have been closed for two to three months, and the economy has come to a global halt. And I mean, forget about art and these prints, it doesn't really mean anything in the big scheme of things, but people, not even rent, people don't have money to buy food, and you can't eat art, and you can't, I mean, they close, close down the courts where I'm from, living in New York, and there's no eviction actions anymore for the time being. So I think that, I mean, we're, if people can't pay for food, they're gonna start to riot, and there'll be uprisings like there have been in the whole Black Lives Matters movement, which has unfolded in America and all over the globe, in Asia, everywhere. And so I think these are very fundamental uh, situations that we're all going through of life and death situations that are way beyond anything um, as simple as just showing art. But it has to do with the fact that, like, you know, it's a basic human need to, to eat and to live. 
and people just can't afford these things, and we're going to have to provide staples for people because otherwise there's going to be a civil war all over the world. So and I'm a little bit off piste on that, but. So, and what I find interesting about this Corona nurse is, is for example, a book uh, by esteemed uh, art collector Erling Kacke, who's also um, uh, Endeavor and uh, Adventurous. And he wrote an entire book about, I think it's called like collecting uh, art with small budget. And there he describes um, him acquiring a nurse painting at $50,000 and selling it uh, I think five years later for five million. So the whole um, uh, the whole uh, his whole practice kind of builds um, up on uh, buying this work and reselling it for a lot of money and then building a collection based um, uh, on this painting. And it's somehow for those. I mean, it's it's some, I see somehow also like art world referential uh, comment because also Richard Prince's career um, uh, was very much um, connected to Barbara Gladstone, and then Larry Gagosian opened a new gallery, I think, next door to it, and opened the new space with Richard Prince, um, which um, uh, made the point of him leaving her, and uh, I remember a great interview Richard Prince gave, and he was asked how he's um, dealing uh, with his decrease of the market and the uh, economic crisis in 2007. And uh, he had just bought his airplane and said, oh, actually, it's not too much of a problem because I just got my own pilot license and what's really expensive with having your own plane is a pilot. Uh, so uh, it's kind of a cynical um, uh, comment at the same time where you have this idealized um, because from a, uh, in, you know, a caution roman uh, um, cover, uh, this idealized idea of a nurse uh, at the same time uh, in Germany and all other places, um, social workers and nurses were the most risked um, in their work field by being infected with COVID and at the same time being essential and significantly underpaid. So uh, I thought it's, um, uh, it's an interesting continuation in appropriation art and um, I was very happy to, to release it. Well, I think another important thing is so much of the rhetoric about art today is about money and about how expensive art is and how it's such an exclusionary field which is only accessible to wealthy people. And I think that's just completely wrong. I mean, I started my whole career in arts based on prints and drawings. And with the advent of Instagram, which I think is absolutely revolutionized in, a, in like a wrecking ball of, um, of democracy throughout the art world, and attacking these kind of hierarchies of exclusivity. And prints and drawings are so, I mean, you can get stuff for a couple hundred dollars or less. And on Instagram, I found so many extraordinary artists that I work with and forge relationships with and that are just so cheap. I mean, a couple of hundred bucks or whatever. And I think that for me, I've been doing this for 30 years. And again, like, I mean, to be here and to be running to art fairs and I write a lot about auctions and art fairs and the upper echelons of the art world, but I love art so much. It makes the hair stand up on my arm. It makes me cry. My family is involved in it and it's like this kind of um, thread of communication, that's what art is basically. And art is not about money. And art and the market are two lines. And sometimes they cross, but mostly they don't. And when I, I said to my students when I was teaching during the crisis, like, I'm so glad to be sitting here on this stupid Zoom thing because like, I'm in the art world and you never get to talk about art. And I teach so I can continue to learn because learning about art is a process that never stops. And every single day there's something more to be learned. And Art is not about, has been not, nothing, I mean, I'm glad that people buy and sell it or whatever, but, you know, five million flipping the Richard Prince and blah, blah. Art is not really, I mean, you make money selling art and you make wealth by keeping it, but you could buy drawings and you could buy art really cheaply. And I say that I start teaching because in the art world, as a profession, you don't get, nobody wants to hear about art 
we only want to know who's buying it, who's selling it, who's showing it, and, and that's so boring. And I mean, no one can get into art without really caring about it and sweating and bleeding for it over the course of decades. It's a slow burning process, it's not a quick fix, and it takes a lifetime of accruing information and knowledge. And for me, communicating it, and I get, I mean, I commercially to survive, I sell other people's art, and I've been involved in deals like a Cezanne and Van Gogh and Picasso, and I get more satisfaction teaching a class or publishing an article, exposing things and sharing information that people could not otherwise get other than these articles that I write. It gives me such a degree of satisfaction that I can't even describe it to you because I mean, there's no value that you can ascribe to something where you affect people. I just love to motivate people or inspire people that art is not really this cesspool of corruption that you normally hear about, but there's a lot of great things and a lot of relationships could be forged. And now through these phones, these stupid phones that we're all so addicted to, in a way they're a gateway to, to, to meet real people in real life situations that can like have changed my life in so many different ways for the better. I, I remember that you once said that uh, before you started to be involved in the art world, you thought that the works in the museums go straight to the museums from the artist studio and uh, couldn't imagine an intermedia uh, like a dealer or collector or auction house uh, being, being involved there. Do you think that, uh, talking about Instagram, that what we have seen in the music industry or also somewhat in the self-publishing industry uh, that artists, like if you look at the top 10 German Spotify uh, charts, uh, these are usually uh, gangster rappers uh, um, which are self-publishing and don't, um, it kind of left the ordinary uh, major label uh, music publishing industry, so they're self-publishing. Do you think that um, I don't know, looking five, ten years ahead, um, galleries and agents and uh, all this thing might become obsolete and there is kind of a self-promoting... Um don't ask somebody to confuse me, so just stop right there before <laughs> I forget what I'm talking about. But I just think, I mean, he's touched on so many different issues. But I'll start with the fact that I think part of my enthusiasm and my passion derives from the fact that I came, I mean, I didn't enter an art gallery until I was 27. In fact, I didn't, know, I didn't know galleries existed because nobody in my family had any exposure. And I'm like an idiot, idiot savant. And I thought that art, an artist made art and it went to a museum. And during university, I was studying philosophy and political science and I started to go to museums. So I became acquainted with Cy Twombly and Basquiat and Warhol and all these artists that were in the National Gallery, in the East Wing of the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. And I was so stupid, I just didn't, it never occurred to me that you could buy art and it's actually sell it in a gallery context. And from there, I, I went to law school really to figure out what I wanted to do because I had no clue and you certainly couldn't, harder to make a living in philosophy than it is as an artist. And I went to law school and had full-time jobs throughout school and went into the fashion business afterward. You wouldn't know it by my rags. And, um, and then I was procrastinating between jobs and I went to Andy Warhol's estate sale in 1988 in 70s. And they were gearing up for a regular springtime auction at Sotheby's, and I literally had this epiphany, I mean, until I was well into my 20s. From there, I saw an advertisement in the New York Times for a Cy Twombly print show. Again, like, I can never, like, drawings give me such a sense of satisfaction, and there's so much to be gained from a work on paper and the intimacy of a drawing. And I remember going to the gallery and Again, like I was so taken aback by this whole attitudinal problem that these people, that not you of course, but people in galleries where they look you up and down, look at your shoes, and make these assumptions about you and, and judgments, and it's really kind of not a terribly welcoming environment. I think it's so incredible what you've done, like putting prices on these labels. That's, a rev that's sadly a revolution in the art world. And it's funny because I ran away from, I graduated law school and then I ran away from big business and then art became bigger than the business I was running away from, which is where we stand today. But I think the freshness, like when I first, I went to the gallery and saw these Cy Twombly prints and I had remarkably somehow passed the bar exam, even though I never went to the school, I was always in night school. 
And from there, I had a part-time job writing for a law firm, and I went to J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, and I said I would like a loan for $10,000 to buy a piece of art. And they turned their head sideways like you do when a dog doesn't understand the command that you're saying. They looked at me like I should be institutionalized, and they said no, of course. And then I went back to the law firm and made the head of the law firm call up the bank, and they gave me a loan. And I started to immediately get professionally involved. Like to this day, I used to complain a lot about art dealers because of just these very things that I was saying. And now I've grown to just absolutely adore art dealers because it's such a difficult job. It's such a hapless job to be an art dealer. You get such, I mean, the artists are always looking over your shoulder for the next opportunity. You nurture a career. As soon as the artist starts to do well, they move to a, a bigger gallery or better gallery, and it's really a no-win situation. And people talk today about the crisis with mid to small level galleries. This has been this crisis has been around. The business model is is flawed for art galleries. It's always going to be a struggle. I hustle as much now to make a living as I did 25 years ago. So. But do you um, think the art dealer will become sort of obsolete at some uh, point? Not, like, so that brings me, <laughs> thank you for putting me back on track before I start to ramble. But um, I think, again, to you, I can just give a lecture about you for two hours, but I think what you're doing by having this kind of art fair, fake art fair slash yard sale, or whatever you want to call it. Garage sale. <laughs> thank you, you said it, not me. But I think that this, you, this is something like what you, I have not been to one digital online viewing room during this last three month lockdown. I go on Instagram all day long. My kids think I have a mental problem and I'm addicted because I go on Instagram. But like, if you try to go into a typical online viewing room, you have to sign your name, your email, your address, your social security number. It's so boring and my attention is so- Not with us, not with us. No. But I think like, by you putting the prices on the wall is a kind of a, quiet revolution, and I think by you doing this kind of hybrid slash art fair, whatever you want to call it, this is like, if galleries, I could never, like again, like when I went into the art world, I thought everyone was drinking absinthe and cutting their ears off, and I would have that one hell of a good time at a party, and it was more conservative than the legal field. I mean, it was more conservative to be in the art world when I started in, the, in 1988 than it was to, um, to, to be in a law firm. It's shocking, but the art world is so, hesitant to change. It's so weird because you would think that it's so liberal-minded and so nimble on its feet and flexible, but I think that this kind of lockdown has accelerated uh, the acclimation of these old people like me to technology where I have to figure out, I almost didn't teach my class at School of Visual Arts because I was so petrified to figure out how to turn on Zoom. Uh, I was scared and I almost literally backed out of the class. It turned out to be the best experience I ever had in my professional life. And the fact is that um, there's so much change happening now, and I think some of the best art that's ever been made will happen in the next, between today and the next 15 years or 10 years because of everything that we've suffered through. But galleries have to change. Auction houses have to change. Like there's an auction that you introduced me to where they're working with galleries and artists to sell primary art. You have this unorthodox uh, model of presenting art to a buying public. I mean, if galleries are so, I mean, if you think the biggest transformation in art dealing is Larry Gagosian having 18 galleries, I mean, that's pretty sad and pathetic. I mean, I have to say though, he didn't fire, and all of these big galleries in New York have fired so many people, it's atrocious. Like, there's no loyalty, there's no kind of ongoing relationship that these people have. But Gagosian, for all the bad things you can say, that he'll rip the fillings out of your mouth if you're laying in the street having a heart attack. He also loves art like crazy, and he's done a lot to like really foster this kind of thing. Art galleries and dealers, everyone has to change. Times are changing. Like technology and all of these things, like with Richard Prince and his appropriation, it was reflecting music and sampling of uh, extrapolating from existing songs and mixing them up into a new way and creating something entirely new. There's something like economical about that in a sense. And you're changing, you're doing like this space is so unusual and so extraordinary. It's, it's not like a typical uh, clinical uh, white wall space. I mean, I can't understand why galleries are all closed on Sundays when everyone's free to go to galleries. None of them have the price on the wall. They're all sitting behind these desks that you can't even see over. And they're all like treating you like shit. And, the, and you're, you're the 
patron and you're going to the space to have an experience. I remember I gave a talk in Zurich right before the Basel Fair and Hans Ulrich came to talk to my class with me and I went into Eva Preston Huber Gallery and some person who was obviously a lot wealthier than I was or whatever and better dressed walked into this part of the gallery where they had a display of works by Ugo Rodinoni and the person that worked for the gallery said this is private. I mean there's art by an artist who wants his work to be seen. And there's a person who is not like going to rob anybody who wants to look at it. And this disconnect between the art world became so removed from their audience and their constituency. And so I think this, if, if galleries don't change in the next five years, they're all going to be out of business. But again, the question, why, why need of a gallery anyway? You're asking me. I'm asking I'm you. I should be asking you. I mean, galleries, like, I'm, when I sell art, I never sell to private collectors. I'm a dealer to dealer to dealer. I always joke that I can't sell crack to a crackhead because I'm the worst salesman, and I love to learn about art, and I love to collect it, and now I don't really have enough funds to engage to the extent that I like to, which is every minute, but, and hoard stuff. But art dealers nurture, in the best of all worlds, art dealers do what artists are incapable of doing, selling. I mean selling art, you could, I mean, uh, Jerry, the critic Jerry Saltz recently posted something and it said it takes a tiny amount of hours to become a police person in America and it takes 10 times that amount of time to become a beautician in America. And then I wrote, how much time does it take to, like, to be licensed? But art advisors, I hope there's no, I'm not putting anyone down in the immediate vicinity of where I'm sitting, but like it takes no training to become an art advisor. But in art, I love art dealers because the support that they give to artists by simply presenting their work and having their work seen. This space is a monument to your art and to your hard work and your foresight. And I just think the people that are just day in and day out presenting the work of artists, what does it take to be an art dealer, a good art dealer, besides having the physical space? Yeah, it's to sell. I mean, again, like, I can't sell drugs to a drug addict. And an art dealer has this incredible role of being this kind of, I don't call it a middle person or anything demeaning like that. I think they do a heroic task, which is communicating art to an audience of people. Because art can't exist in a vacuum, and you need an audience to communicate. Art is a means of communication. Social, political, economic issues that we all face, a lot of my art has to do with that. Um, those mechanisms, but what art dealers do is that. They, they, they have to change and create new ways of doing it. You can't just sit on your high horse and go to the next fair or present a small amount of people in a stable, but you're, at, you're on your feet. With all of these galleries were doing the same boring online viewing rooms, you did so many live Instagram talks. I mean, just to keep track, I tried to watch as many as I could, but you did something that nobody else did. You didn't stop. You're restless, you're not complacent. You're always on your feet and agile and looking for different ways to do your job. In a way that if there were more people, if there were more people like me, the world would be a disaster. More people like you, and you do a great service to people, which is largely unsung, and finding ways to communicate. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But, but again, when we look at the self-publishing possibilities of artists now on Instagram, where they can control how they want to be seen, how they present themselves, how they can educate their followers on how they want to, how they want their work to be read and interpreted and contextualized because they can also contextualize it with the control of their creation. What, why do we need, why do they still need a spokesperson? There's an artist that I absolutely fell in love with who we just met each other online in Instagram. She's in her mid 60s and living in Austria, a Hungarian artist, and had been always making art but rarely showed it at all. And I just stumbled upon her art and I fell so hard for her art and she's one of the kindest, most lovely, considerate human beings I've ever met um, on the planet and makes art that grips me in every place. And I introduced her work and I curated it into an exhibition at Art Fair in Los Angeles in February and the work sold to some extraordinary people and I continue to expose it on my Instagram site, and she gets inundated with DMs, direct messages from people, literally every other day, if not more, of people trying to buy art. 
artists make art. Artists are not salespeople. And also, this is another, like, I remember, I never bought a lot of stuff in, online in Amazon. And then I moved and I needed a garbage can. And I bought a garbage can online. And it got delivered and it was like a thimble. It was like this big. And I could fit one piece of crumpled paper in my garbage can. And nothing, I don't care what kind of virtual world that we enter, with the goggles and the glasses and the holograms, nothing will ever substitute the physical experience of putting your nose against a painting or a drawing or a sculpture, unless it's a digital piece that was created to be seen in that context. Nothing will ever substitute for the physical proximity to a work of art, which is just, um, unless it's wildly over-fabricated or whatever, but like looking at a drawing or a simple painting or a print or a photograph or anything and seeing the way the artist intended it to be seen, there's no, Instagram is a weak, uh, Instagram is a tool for art to be communicated, but it's not a way for art to be experienced. Art fairs are the worst, stupidest way to see art. With a million people, three walls, flimsy walls with bad lighting, running, run, 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 go to the next one, go to the next thing, go, go get online to go to the bathroom and get a cup of coffee. That's ridiculous. And Instagram and digital means will never substitute walking into this space and going and seeing this uh, installation we have on the second floor. I can never pronounce their names correctly, so I'm gonna... And Green and Grok said. Them. Going to see that space, I mean, I've seen 100,000 pictures on Instagram. It must be one of the most uh, photographed. You can't reproduce that. You can't. Maybe in 25, 50 years, there'll be some equivalent projected in the middle of your living room. But art is meant to be experienced physically, and nothing will ever substitute it. Artists don't want to spend their whole day, morning, noon, and night, packing, shipping, and uh, selling art. I bought a print in Japan from this artist, and I didn't pay for a couple of months just because he didn't finish making the prints. And the gallery called him up and said, can you call Kenny Shackler and get three grand? And it's like, I wasn't being stingy about the money. The piece wasn't ready. He told me the piece wasn't ready to be picked up. But they asked this artist, who's a well-known, successful artist, to go chase me for three and a half thousand dollars is ridiculous. And artists are not collection agencies. They're not salespeople. They're artists. And artists need to think and make art. And what's interesting, I think, in so thinking of running for office. And so, so what, what I think it's interesting talking about the dealing of art, uh, and um, I think it's something we can't avoid talking about, um, is a new tendency which my, maybe not so many people are familiar of. Are certain uh, that's work been uh, traded in shares, so that uh, there's an opportunity on the market, and one dealer acquires a work of art with others together, like usually three parties, two parties, and then of course the, it, it comes with a lot of trust and you trust the person that he has a possession of the art. So what in fact happened with Inigo Filbrick, uh, uh, at least to the, to the news reports, is that he bought works with other people's uh, funds and his own funds and then uh, resold the, the works of art multiple times. And um, and maybe you can give us a small run through on the current situation about this and and, uh, uh, and how this whole process maybe works. Well, um, you mentioned fractional ownership, which you mentioned to me the other day that you thought it was a nice idea or it could work, where you literally take like a Picasso painting and sell a million shares in it. So every, I mean, there was one company that sold fractional ownership of a Picasso lent it to a museum and put a camera in so you could real-time watch your stupid little painting sitting in the museum that you own like two fibers of the canvas of. I mean, when I studied uh, in law school, the way they would describe a commercial transaction, there was this imaginary product, I don't know if there's a German word for it, called a widget. And a widget is like a nothing, it's just this thing, if you're talking about the commercial transaction and how the laws relate to the, any given transaction, you talk about a widget as a thing. Art is not a widget, and I'm so against these stupid ideas of buying a fraction of a painting. I mean, don't buy art if you're not gonna be able to live with it, or, I mean, look, people should do whatever the hell they want, and I'm not here to describe what you should and what you shouldn't do with your money. You can do whatever the hell you want. So if you wanna buy a percentage of a widget, by all means, enjoy yourself, knock yourself out, and then go watch it sitting in a museum. And then like when you try to sell it, I can assure you you're gonna lose all your money 
because someone's going to do something wrong or it's not going to, art is not, if you buy art thinking, look, we make a living in art. So nevertheless, the only way you can successfully make a living in art is if you're crazy in love with art and it makes the hair stand up on your arm and it makes, that's the only way that people are successful, whether it's Gugosian or anybody else, it's because you have a deep, deep, deep knowledge, understanding, appreciation, and passion for what you do. So art is not a stock share, and I don't believe in the concept. Artists don't make artists art, so it can be sold, in, unless you're Duchamp making a share certificate, which was a piece of art in and of itself, and meant to be a comment about these types of idiotic behaviors. And Indigo Philbrick was a young guy, and it's a very complicated story just because for a while, he had a very legitimate business, which was very, he, dad was an institutional curator, so at a very early, he was spoon-fed art from the day he was born, and whenever someone does something wrong in the world, all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, I knew they were bad people from the beginning. The second I saw them, they, I could smell it. They were dishonest, and they were, but I mean, it's such a bunch of bullshit in the art world, because I like to say the art world has its own particular brand of hypocrisy. And part of my writing is to sort of reveal all of these types of relationships and dishonesty. Fake news is something that the art world clings to and is in love with in every way. I mean, I've never met, present company excluded, I've never met an art dealer that doesn't lie about something, you know, not just to their parents either. I mean, they just lie. It's part of the training of being an art dealer is to learn to tell a straight face lie. How did you do with the art fair? I sold everything. Really, did you sell it? I sold it at the fair. I didn't sell it all before, and blah, blah, blah. It's such a bunch of, a can of worms, of a cesspool of corruption and lies. But Indigo was really, he knew his shit cold because he uh, was raised on a diet of art. However, I believe that he'll come to symbolize, because I don't guess not many, some of you must know, it's, you'll, you're going to find out soon enough because it's, it's slowly, he just got arrested, he was in hiding since November, was arrested last Friday in Vanuatu. He failed to like Google which uh, island countries didn't have an uh, extradition treaty with the United States and which did. But the reason he was allowed to steal, he was able to steal between 50 and 100 million dollars was because of this climate of greed that has really defined the last 25 years of the art world when you don't read in the, art, in the newspaper that an artist made a breakthrough in their painting or sculpture, you read that a painting sold for $450 million. And then as a result, you have all of these other people thinking, well, this is one hell of an easy way to make money, fast. I could buy it, flip it, loan on it, lend money to the next speculator and make a quick buck. But anything too good to be true is too good to be true. And Inigo was this young, good-looking, confident, overconfident person and he was very convincing, and he knew a hell of a lot about art. So he was able to borrow money on art, selling int fractional interest, but that really wasn't where his fraud lies. His fraud was in using art to get as collateral for loans, keeping control of the collateral, and then taking five more loans on the same art. And I joke that I can't sell a piece of art once, and he sold the same piece of art five times. So he would sell one painting to five different owners and everybody would think that they own the painting completely. That's a whole other kind of fractional ownership. So I really think that he'll come to symbolize a bookend in the art market in a period where there was so much you know, unabashed, naked greed. And, that will, and people were just throwing money for a quick fix and they, no one did their homework and no one did their due diligence. And as a result, a lot of people lost a lot of money. And I can tell you there's a hell of a lot more people that are too embarrassed to admit they lost money, and they're just going to sort of walk away from the loss. And it'll be turned into a film, and it'll be turned into a documentary, and that's me trying to recoup some of the money I lost by selling my article into a movie. But that's another story. Another. So but what actually happened is that, that it got out of hand, and he thought, like, with people who are addicted to gambling or to stock market uh, transaction, he thought like, with the next deal he's going to fix it. Exactly. It's human nature, I mean, it's not endemic to the art world, although we has characterized the last 25 years of meteoric rises in young artists' markets and people like Phillips Auction House, <laughs> selling art where you can still smell the oil in the oil paint as the painting is spinning around on the auction podium to be so resold. So um, I think that 
someone like Inigo doesn't, it's not just an indictment of the art world, although it's certainly that, but it's really reflective of human nature and greed has been around since one of the original sins and the art world loves its seven deadly sins, all of them. And uh, it had to do with a lot of things. I think that he's, he has a mental sickness, obviously, and uh, my dad always said to me, I know you're gonna lie to me all day long, but don't believe your own lies. And that was, I never got along with him, but I always took what he said with, um, with a grain of salt, but I, I, it was a great advice. And like these people always think, like the next deal, like you said, the next deal, he sold the painting at auction, and for the third or fourth time, last May, a Rudolf Stengel portrait of Pablo Picasso, and um, if that painting had sold for 12 or 13 million dollars, which wasn't out of the question a few years ago, there wouldn't be 500 articles about this person soon to be in a movie theater near you. It would never have happened, so. Um, yeah, that's interesting because you really can't predict that suddenly everybody wakes up and understands African-American art has been totally overlooked and then the, there was a shift in market uh, to that and to women art. But you told me a story which maybe uh, as a close or roundup, um, you can give us a quick rundown on which I thought was kind of fascinating, I didn't know about. Um, uh, two nights ago you told me about this doctor or this guy who stole money from a children's hospital fund uh, because he got addicted to art collecting and then somehow triggered the art market we know today by the sale they made at auction to, uh, to recoup the money he has stolen. This is going from bad to worse. <laughs> I'm getting depressed. Can we talk about the nice weather or something else? I mean, I mean this is really after, awful. after. This is getting awful. Okay, so like, you have to understand that I'm, I have kids and I'm a compassionate, considerate person, but when it, I can also be an asshole a bit. And I call this guy like the best, the world's best art collector, and I'm, I don't mean to be flippant, and I can hit myself over the head with this microphone, but this man was the head of a foundation in Boston in charge of children's heart ailments. And art is a compulsion. I mean, like, nothing will stop the art world. I don't, this pandemic, these riots, this economic downturn, as long as people are living and breathing and there's not a nuclear conflagration, people will always make art, people will always collect art, people will always exhibit art. It's part of human nature. It runs through our circulatory system and nothing will ever change it. I was hoping to forget what I was talking about so I wouldn't have to say. But anyway, this guy, yeah? What time? What time? Like, uh, 1996. Uh, what time? I don't know. No, no, no. no, no. I mean, <laughs> we are in the 90s, yeah? Yeah. We're in, no, now we're in 2000. So, what happened was this man stole, he, I, you see, like, an art collector, uh, I always say, like, having no money will never stop a, a collector. Nothing stops a collector. It's a disease, like, crash. <laughs> and, like, these people who collect art, it becomes, like, it has nothing to do with how much space they have, how many walls they have. It's more a question of how much storage do they have and what can they get away with by paying something over time. Or So anyway, this guy got the bug in a serious way and he stole money from the foundation that was meant to... When he went to jail, Sotheby's auctioned off his collection and this was in the year 1996. And Sotheby's made a decision with Tobias Mayer, who was the auctioneer, is it Mayer or is it Mayer? So they made a determination at Sotheby's to sell his collection in an evening sale. So every time there's an auction, Jeff Kuhn sold the piece for $91 million, blah, blah. So this was the first time that any of these artists, um, Kiki Smith, Robert Gober, Jeff Koons, Matthew Barney, all of these artists, this was the first time typically an auction house would look as a money center at Impressionist and Modern Art. Monet and Degas and Van Gogh, and that's where all the dough was. And nobody cared about contemporary art because there was no money. So when this man stole the money and he went to jail, they sold his contemporary art collection in an evening sale. That was the first time in history, except for 1973 when uh, there was a famous divorce and the Skull Collection was sold at auction. But and the people, artists like Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns ended up, but everything stopped after 73 and not until this person's sale in 96, and an auction record was set, it went so well. Uh, Jeff Koons made $260,000, and 
and that was his world record. Kiki Smith went for $261,000, and that's the first time that the auction people looked at contemporary art as we know it today and thought, this is more than just the whim of people, of young people. This could actually be a place that the auction houses could look to to monetize the artistic, artistic production of the time. So that really, for me, I mean, that marks the beginning of this crazy, rampant period of pornographic uh, monetization of art as an asset class. And it ends with Indigo Philbrick, where he just saw all these fools and suckers dangling millions of dollars in front of him, and he took it. So, like, of course I blame him. He thinks he didn't do anything wrong. I mean, I had come, he was getting in touch with me over the past couple of months through aliases, through Instagram, and saying he did nothing wrong. He just, these people shouldn't have been in the business in the first instance. And whether you're rich or poor, you still are a person and a human being, and you have rights, and no one should take anything uh, unduly from another person. Whether you're rich or poor, you can't make those judgment calls. And he just said, well, these people shouldn't have been in the business. And they were dangling all of this money in front of him and he illegally took it. So I think that there you have 25 years starting with a great way for younger artists to be able to participate and not wait till they're dead to make a living. And then it ends with this situation where it's become a bit of a, of a disaster area. But and maybe uh, last, a little outlook. What do you think we're gonna see in the next a uh, couple of years, how, how, what will change? What will the situation be with art fairs? Well, I think like, the biggest change we've seen is how people of my generation, uh, there's 20 years that separate you and me, and the fact is that people looked at technology with trepidation, people in their 40s and 50s and 60s, and now everyone has just jumped in. They have no choice. If you want to communicate to another person when you're locked in your house for two months, you have to adapt. So I think that this crisis and technology is going to be, obviously, as it evolves, it's the most important transformation in the art world that we will see in the course of our lives. These phones only started in 2007 and Instagram started in 2010, I'm pretty sure, and life has never been the same. And I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. I think it's a great thing because I work by myself, I spend a lot of time in solitude. That's why I'm always talking so much, because I'm sitting by myself in my house, and no one in my family um, listens to me. So I seize every moment to have a captive audience, like you guys in this little place. And, and you all answer every DM, right? I mean, I feel it's my obligation. I'm compelled to answer. I always, that's a good point, because anytime I teach or I lecture all over the place, and I always say, if you ever have anything to say to me, good or bad, I can handle it, not so much the terrible criticism, but I, if anyone gets in touch with me, it's my obligation as a human being to respond, and I respond pretty quickly. I don't always scroll to the bottom of the screen, but I feel like I have taken, I spent 30 years doing this business in every which way you can, and I feel like it's, I'm compelled to share everything I know, because I wanna, I wanna, I'm very, like I said, cynically idealistic. I mean, I hate everyone until they prove differently, I always, I do not trust anyone, nobody, until I learn differently. But in the end, like, I'm very optimistic and very hopeful that the next phone call could be a great opportunity, the next email, and anyone, I mean, I've had, I gave a lecture to my kid's class when he was 15, 16, and I said the same thing. And then the next, two days later, or the next week, he goes to me, what are you doing? So I said, I have a meeting. And he said, who are you meeting with? I'm like, I don't know, one of the kids from your class. He's like, what the hell is wrong with you? What do you, I said, look, I don't care if you're a zillionaire or someone who just wants to know. Like, could this be a field? I want to make open possibilities to people that despite what you read, despite all this negativity that I'm sitting here myself engaging in, I really love art so much. I couldn't think of a better place to be sitting on this beautiful day in this city. The world is coming back to life, and we're listening, we're here. Anyone who wants to get in touch, I'm right on Instagram under my name, DM me, and I, if I can help you in any way, if I can thesis advise, I teach all the time, and I, tr I share the information. It's the opposite of when I first went to an art gallery in the late 80s, and they looked at me like I was some kind of lunatic, which I am, but I was a lunatic who loves art, so why shouldn't I be, and I, I've collected a lot of art over the time. So maybe there's some questions uh, right now and right here. Sorry, because I'm, ex I'm exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> any questions, someone? Nope. <laughs> They're all going to 
to reach out later via DM. <laughs> 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 All my phone's out of batteries. Question? No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We covered it all. What's the next article you're writing or your next uh, topic? That I want to write about all you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I was. Um, you were actually in the story in my next article because I was going back to my hotel and all I, I dress for comfort. So I wear all these old Adidas pants just because they have an elastic waist. I gained a lot of weight during the COVID and I draped the fabric. And I always wear the same pants all the time. And I was walking into my hotel and I saw this young woman wearing an Adidas jacket. And I was just staring at this blue velvet Adidas jacket. And I was thinking like, that is so cool. What a cool jacket. Like I could see that would go really well with the pants that I was wearing. And then someone said my name and she was sitting with today's rope pack. And he goes, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I don't, what are you doing here? And it was just, for me, it was such a cool thing to like, it meant that we're all coming back, that there's hope and there's like, the world is coming back. To, I mean, it's been a great respite. I love the fact that there were no art fairs uh, for three months and 2020 is basically a write-off. So there'll probably be, I mean, I'm sure Basel, Miami is gonna be canceled. And I think that, I mean, if someone would have said 2020 is the year where um, there are no art fairs. I remember when I did, I curated an exhibition and Malcolm McLaren, the musical impresario was in the exhibition I curated in London in the year 2000. He was running for mayor and part of his platform was he wanted to introduce no buying days. And anytime my kids would hassle me to go take them to buy a toy or something, I would say, oh no, it's a no buy day. We can't buy anything, all the stores are closed. And I think no art fairs has been a tremendous thing. Artists should not be sitting there like, I think what, I mean, Mike Kelly was one of my favorite artists, is one of my favorite artists, and he took his own life in like 2010. And I think that in a way he was an artist who embraced failure and ended up like, making a pact with the devil to show with Pelosian. And I think success contributed to his demise that having to have a studio employing 40 assistants and having to make art for this art fair machine, which helps galleries in so many ways stay in existence. But in the end, you know, you don't go into art so you can feed art fair machinery. And um, well, the next article I'm gonna write will be about the auctions coming up and coming to Berlin and just seeing that like things are starting all over again. We're never gonna be the same. No one's ever gonna be the same after surviving and going through what we've all gone through. But I tend to think that it could be a good dose of reality testing. And I think that it's not such a, it's a bad thing that through an illness and a sickness and these riots and unrest, I mean, that we're all going through. But this is a good hard lesson for America to learn. For like people of authority and police people to commit murder is pretty atrocious, inhumane activity. And this whole nonstop you know, rat race of our fairs is bullshit. And it's it's good for people to like think twice about what they do, why they do it, and how they do it. And to uh, circle back to why we're here, these two prints are available for sale 24 seven on kd2kunik.com. <laughs> and they are limited to 60, hand signed by the artist, and numbered by us, <laughs> signed by him. And they I cost- If I can't count otherwise, I would. And they cost 800 euros net, uh, depending on the With time. A discount. <laughs> Without discount. Without discount. Plus discount. With discount. And then um, from July on, 16% uh, only. Thank you so much. Kenny, thank you so much for coming. And thank you all for uh, sharing your time with us.